when we read the Bible, there are times I find when we are at a disadvantage. And I say that because we read the words like any other book. We don't always have the verbal clues. We don't necessarily have tone of voice, inflection. Uh, the, the writers didn't always include those kind of details for us to say this person shouted this or this person was disappointed or however the case is. Uh, so there's a certain amount of interpretation, you know, some latitude that we need to take with that. Uh, for example, and this isn't what we're focusing on this morning, but uh, the, the account of Peter walking on the water. Uh, he was walking towards Jesus and he saw the storm around him and he started to sink. And we read in the Bible, Jesus said, you of little faith, why do you doubt? Now, did Jesus just say it flat tone like I just did? Or did he have more compassion? You of little faith, why did you doubt like that? Or was he disturbed when he said it? Uh, you know, our minds can go in a lot of different directions. We don't really know. We have to sort of take what we know and uh, apply it the best that we can. The same goes with the book of Job. Uh, he was a man who understood his faith well. He understood God a lot better than his friends did, for sure. And I wonder uh, how he got to that point, first of all, in his life. Did he have just a God-fearing, God-loving parents that instilled this faith in him? But even so, we know that you can't pass along your faith to your children. We do our best, but you know they don't always uh, go along with it like we do. We aren't really going to know any of those details, I guess, until we get there and we get to talk to Job, if it makes a difference at that point. This morning, we're going to look at words from Job in chapter 16 of his, the book that bears his name, and some words that I think indicate some frustration, and uh, rightfully so, considering all that he's been through but also look at sort of the story beneath the story, too, and uh, explore that as well. So before we get into it much more, uh, we will read um, those verses in uh, Job chapter 16. Uh, if you're following in your pew Bible, it's page 368. And just reading from verse uh, 6 through 14. The word of the Lord says, yet if I speak, my pain is not relieved, and if I refrain, it does not go away. Surely, O God, you have worn me out. You have devastated my entire household. You have bound me, and it has become a witness. My gauntness rises up and testifies against me. God assails me and tears me in his anger and gnashes his teeth at me. My opponent fastens on me his piercing eyes. Men open their mouths to jeer at me. They strike my cheek in scorn and unite together against me. God has turned me over to evil men and thrown me into the clutches of the wicked. All was well with me, but he shattered me. He seized me by the neck and crushed me. He has made me his target. His archers surround me. Without pity, he pierces my kidneys and spills my gall on the ground. Again and again, he burst upon me. He rushes at me like a warrior. May the Lord's blessing be added to the reading and hearing of his holy word. So let's just set Job aside for just a moment here. And as I said uh, before reading the passage, I'd love to know how this guy came to have such great faith. Again, was it righteous parents? Was it... Uh, well, it certainly had to do with the Holy Spirit, we know that. Maybe other things. Maybe he saw people who fell by the wayside and didn't want to be like them. But regardless, um, that's, that's, that's how it is in our lives sometimes. And I find nature fascinating too. We see a lot of these things that are mirrored in nature. Um, a lot of animals, the way that they uh, treat their young and the way they treat each other. Uh, shows a certain amount of intelligence that we might not give them credit for. And I think oftentimes they exceed my expectations. 
Uh, one animal, for example, is the killer whale. It's also known as the orca. And uh, the name killer whale, though, is an unfortunate name because uh, I didn't realize before really looking at them, uh, they, we think killer whales are whales that kill us. Uh, that's not the case with the orca. Uh, they are actually, it'd be better to call them whale killers, because that's what they do. Uh, but um, just a few facts about them. A grown ones about the size of a school bus, weighs six tons or so, so they're big. Mothers give birth typically one at a time, and uh, they should have a long life because man is the orca's only natural predator. Very intelligent animals. The parents take the young and they teach them, they take the time to teach them how to hunt. Uh, orcas love more than anything a nice tasty seal, a big fat seal. They, they start, uh, I'm sure, salivating over one of them. So what their parents will do is they will take the, the young orca, nudge it up onto the beach. They have to get up onto the beach in order to get at one of these seals. And they'll give a practice. Okay, there's the seal, have at it. And if the young orca can't do it, they'll pull it back into the water, push it back up onto the, uh, onto the uh, beach, and they try it again until they get it. His parent knows that this is something that the young has to do to survive. And not all that different from being a Christian, I guess. Not eating seals, of course, but the way that we train and teach our young. We have to keep at it. When we become a Christian, we have words for that. We call it being born again. And that new life is in us from that point on, and we learn to live a new life, and it takes practice. And the best time is when we have somebody there to show us the way, like the parent orca does with the young orca. The problem is, at least from what I see in 21st century America, all too often new believers are pretty much left to their own devices to sort of figure out this Christian thing. Okay, you had an experience at church, you felt convicted, you asked Jesus into your heart. Okay, here's a Bible and go read it. You know, that's important, but what do we do after that? And that's honestly one of my biggest criticisms of the modern American church. Seems like the church lacks in training new believers. And uh, that's the process that we call discipleship. And I've mentioned before, discipleship isn't only a religious function. Uh, discipleship was everywhere. Greek philosophers, a lot of them, uh, Aristotle and Socrates, they would have disciples. They teach them, teach them enough that they can then teach other people. And you have this constant uh, cycle where it's taught down through the generations. That's simply applied to religion whenever Jesus came along. He had his own disciples. He taught them these things. And it uh, goes on from there. But what is, what is that really? It's more than just coming to church once every seven days for about an hour or two and getting an inspiring message to get us through the next week. At the ideal, it is a daily routine of checking in with specific people, your friends, your church family, praying for each other, uh, learning about God together, keeping each other accountable, those kind of things. And I realize in the 21st century, our lives are busy. We have families, we have work, we have doctor appointments, you know, all the things that we are, that we have in our schedules. It's not easy to get people to make such a commitment like that, but that's what the Bible demands. Somehow, Job learned to be a great man of faith. We don't know what all that looked like in his life, but he got there anyway. And it made a big difference for him whenever he had this big test as well. We see how Job models Jesus even well before Jesus came on the scene, possibly 2,000 years before Jesus. And so there are very significant parallels between 
Job's life and that of Jesus, uh, especially during Jesus' last days. And I want to look at a few of those with you. But first to tell you, Job is not Jesus. Job was not perfect. So that's one significant difference between the two, of course. The Bible says Job was blameless, but Jesus is sinless. There's a big difference between the two. So that's, that's one difference there. Also, in Job's situation, he was an unwilling participant. Things happened in his life, he had to react. Jesus, on the other hand, from the very beginning, was willing, uh, and he uh, accomplished what the Father uh, set forth for him to do, ultimately going to the cross. So, just to show you a couple differences there, they're not exactly the same, but they are similar enough that we can learn a lot about Jesus through Job. Similarities, for instance, Job had the same adversary as Jesus did, and that's Satan. Satan attacked Job, Satan attacked Jesus. Also, Job says in verse 10, people open their mouths in to jeer at me. They strike my cheek in scorn and unite together against me. If you think of the life of Jesus, did that ever happen anywhere? Think right before his crucifixion. Uh, he was delivered up to the ungodly by God for a purpose and turned over to the hands of the wicked, as the uh, verse says there. Now, with Job, he's using it more of a poetic sense, and Jesus was a very literal sense, but that's how he felt at the time. And so Jesus was uh, delivered up to Satan for trial and for crucifixion. And in the case of Jesus, for a very different reason than Job, Jesus' purpose was to effect salvation, to make it possible for someone to be saved and then, you know, come back into communion with God. Also in verse 12, Job says that God has made me his target. Sort of the same way that Jesus was the focus, he was the target during the Passover feast that year. There's just a few instances of how Job is a picture of Jesus. Again, not exact, but there's a lot of similarities to make us uh, take notice. When I prepare for a message, I, I read the scripture, and I read it again, I read it again, I put it down, and the next day I read it again, because there's always so many different little nuances that come out. That's the great thing about the Bible. It is, if there ever was a living book that speaks to you, that is the Bible. And so, you know, I might notice something the fifth time that I read it as opposed to the first or second. And as I was reading and studying it, I was focusing on the connections to the life of Christ. But then I just sort of thought, this is fine for a Bible study, maybe. It's interesting if you're into that kind of thing, but what, what does it really mean to us? And so I had to step back and uh, look at it from that perspective as well. Uh, first of all, uh, we see Jesus' name doesn't appear in the book of Job. It's not like we have a Christ-like figure who was in Genesis and wrestled with Jacob, if you remember that scene. So we don't have any of that kind of stuff going on here. But even so, Jesus certainly is in Job's reaction to his destruction, or the destruction of his life. Job, conservative scholars say Job was probably the first book that was actually written down in written form. So if, you, if that is true, think of it, after that was written, the book of Job was the Bible, what we would call the Bible. That was the only scripture there was. And I think that's not so bad of a thing, not bad of a choice for the first, because uh, there's so much uh, good stuff, foundational stuff in this book. Um, you have the basics of what we nowadays call the Christian faith, but the Judeo-Christian faith. You have God versus Satan. You have faith versus heresy. You know what Job believed versus his friends. You have a divided family. You have Job versus his wife, go curse God and die. You have the defense versus the prosecutors. 
You have struggles versus perseverance. You have uh, someone who suffers losses yet still clings to faith among all that. You have an accuser or accusers and a believer. So all these things are in these 42 chapters. So if that was your Bible, there's enough in there to lead you to God. And as I was deciding on which parts of the book to present, because again, we're not looking at every verse of all 42 chapters, this chapter jumped out at me as an easy one because it's all about Job and Jesus and these images that I shared with you that I read these and I think, okay, oh, there was Jesus and there was Jesus and there was Jesus. So once we understand that Jesus is here in this book, it opens our hearts and minds to appreciate even more the work that Jesus did for so many. One, Jesus was our substitute. Because no person can stand before God on judgment day based on our own deeds and the things we've done and expect to get into heaven. God demands perfection and we are not perfect by any means. Our, the Bible says that our best works are like filthy rags in his, in his eyes. So none of us can make it to heaven based on just what we have done. That's why God sent his son, Jesus, as a substitute. And he was the perfect sacrifice that could satisfy God's wrath against sin. Now, after dying, God breathed life into Jesus and raising him from the grave. We know that when we were talking about that around Easter time. But look at how easy, in a sense, foundationally to understand, it's easy, how easy God made it. That instead of trying to be a suitable sacrifice that we could never be, all, and I say it, all that we have to do is accept Jesus by believing in him. It's, salvation is by faith. Then, instead of being judged on our works, God looks at the work that his son did in our place. Now, in theory, it sounds easy. As we know in real life, it doesn't always work out to be that easy because there's many people who can't bring themselves to put faith in him for one thing. But back to Job, Job assumed this role, sort of a, a defense attorney, providing his own defense, maintaining his innocence all along, saying, I, I've done wrong things in my life, but nothing to the extent that in being accused of that would bring about this kind of punishment. And that reminds us of Jesus, too. And we don't want to miss this, that while Job acts as a defense attorney, bringing to mind a picture of Jesus, uh, it's thanks to Jesus that we don't have to plead our case before God on Judgment Day. Job's defense was not that he was sinless. It was just that he didn't do anything so bad to warrant this kind of punishment. Bringing us back to Jesus again, because Jesus is the center of our faith. People... Jesus is the very controversial part about Christianity. If you say, I believe in God, there's 90 some percent of the world that's going to be, that's going to agree with you on that. When you start uh, illustrating who God is, that's when you start losing people in a hurry. Uh, is God a spirit? Is God a person? Is God this? Is God that? So people in life, they find out you're a Christian and if they are honest about it, they might ask you some questions. Why do you believe this? Or what do you believe? And so forth. And honestly, people are going to have some ideas about God that are really off the wall. Maybe they've read some popular book on the New York Times bestseller that is written from a secular point of view. And they might ask you questions about this. And I can't answer every question about God that anyone throws at me, and none of us will. So here's the thing. We won't be able to answer every question every time. As we get better, maybe we should be able to answer the common ones that tend to come up. But even so, even, even though we can't answer every question about Jesus and what he did, we should be able to tell anyone, anytime, what Jesus did for us. That's a personal story that we can give to other people. We can say how Jesus changed our life. 
I was like this, now I'm like this. And it's because of Jesus in my life. Look at Job. Somehow, we don't know how it happened. It was earlier in his life. They don't talk about it. Jesus changed him. The Old Testament equivalent, the promise of the Messiah and so forth. But there's such great irony in this book. It is so ironic that this drama is the result of Satan challenging God's goodness and saying that Job only loves God because God gives him stuff and made him rich and all those kind of things. But Satan's attacks didn't drive him from God. It pushed him towards God. Job wanted to go to God and understand better. Nowadays, so many people, they have this kind of wishy-washy faith, if you can call it a faith, that the first time something bad happens, you know, they're gone and they don't give another thought to God. That was not Job. And that showed what kind of real faith he had. Remember those orcas in the beginning, the, the whale killers? They should be called the whale killers. Very intelligent. They take their time to teach their young. Well, the parents set the example for the young, just as Job is an example for us as well, and Jesus is an example for us. Even if whatever situation we find ourselves in isn't as bad as Job's, we can see how he clung to his faith in situation that just dwarfs whatever we are dealing with, so there's no reason we can't do the same. Everything in the Bible goes back to faith. That's what it is about. No matter what we're dealing with, we know somebody who's walked the road we've walked in some way, shape, or form. And if you can't think of anybody in your life, well, you know that Jesus was there too. And when you look at the words of Job, they also, that relate to Jesus, maybe you think, oh, you're reading... That's me there. I've thought that already. When you read through chapter 16 and these things that Job is feeling and he's giving voice to, you know, uh, he, you feel like you've been turned over to the wicked or you've been shaken to pieces or uh, you can't find pity anywhere. And uh, all these things are, are happening. If it's you, then you're in good company because there's Job and there's Jesus. So we can take comfort knowing that the trials didn't last for Job. They did end. We haven't gotten that far yet, but they will. And the same with Jesus. His trials didn't last forever either. Uh, that's why he's alive today. So the trials are not enjoyable, but they are there to grow our faith. Job was at a crossroads where he either had to embrace his faith completely or completely reject it. There was really no middle ground for Job here. And the, that question is for us too. Are you going to completely embrace your faith or completely reject it? Uh, and it's not a question that we can answer today. It's a lifelong endeavor where everyone around you can see your answer by the way that you live your life and the way that you respond to things that happen. You know, if you have a bad health diagnosis, are you going to God or are you blaming God? Those kind of things. So Job shows us in the most extreme cases how to live the life of a disciple. He was called to prove his faith many times. And before our council meeting this morning, we always opened with a few devotions. And I shared with the group just a few passages from the New Testament where uh, Jesus talks about the importance of doing good works. And I briefly said how uh, faith doesn't end at faith. It's then followed by good works to prove it out and so forth. Now, 500 years ago, there was a thing called the Protestant Reformation. And I'm not going to get into all that stuff. But one of their rallying cries was salvation is by faith alone. And that is true. But that's the beginning of it again. There were some people back then who really took issue with the, the letter of James, for instance. Because James says, you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Well, they're saying by faith alone. Thing is, it's not a contradiction. James is just talking about what you do after you come to Jesus and you have that understanding. 
So I want to wrap it up here and close out with a verse from Luke that I think uh, is a good summary. And uh, it says, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. There's many applications to that. We can apply that in virtually any area of your life. But an important one is salvation. We've been entrusted with the title of God's children. That's who we are. So that's something big he's entrusted with us. So a lot will be required of his children. With Job, it required great testing. And uh, for us, it might be something else. But those who aren't tested probably aren't on God's radar, too. I've heard of stories where uh, people say, hey, once I came to Christ, things were just great. And that's when people really have to sit a person down and make sure that they understand, were you just having an emotional reaction to something in church or was it something uh, really deep and genuine? We see with Job, by the way he lived his life, that it was genuine. And we pray that the same would be said for each of us. So let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for the trials in our lives because they serve as tests. They either push us away from you or push us towards you. It's one or the other. And we don't like those trials, but we thank you for them because when we get through them with your help, it, it uh, solidifies in our mind the love that you have for us. And we see how you were with us every step of the way, no matter what happened. God, we pray that we would never have happened to us what happened to Job losing all of his children and being on the outs with his wife and losing his business and everything. But we also see, God, that you knew that Job was faithful from the beginning and you knew that he could withstand it. And that is the sign of a true disciple of the faith. I don't know if we're there yet, God. I don't know if any of us here would be able to withstand what Job did with the kind of faith. But we pray that we would be. I guess we won't know until we're in that situation. So God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit's presence in our lives, guiding us along the way, being there for us whenever we need. And God, we just want to remember as we embark upon a new week that the terrible things that happen in our lives, it's a result of the works of Satan to begin with. It's not your will that any would perish, but that all would have everlasting life. But that doesn't happen because there is an enemy in the world who is active and we need to be on guard for him too. But we aren't worried about that because we have the Holy Spirit with us and we have your son, Jesus Christ, and you, God, Father, are with us also. We thank you so much, and we pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.